Devi Sankri Govinda is no stranger to South African audiences. She is an award-winning investigative television journalist. Armed with an MBA, Devi has spent the past 28 years of her life seeking out corruption wherever it may exist, often putting her life in danger, but always holding government, companies and individuals to account. After spending 18 years on carte blanche, Devi made the bold move to ETV and 18 months ago launched The Devi Show, which broadcasts to millions across the country. Devi is mum to an 18-year-old son who is currently taking driving lessons and a 20-year-old daughter who is on a golf scholarship at the University of North Carolina. Devi, huge privilege and honor to have you on today. Welcome to the show. You're such a su successful TV personality. It is such an honor to be speaking with you today. Um, please tell us a little bit more about your recent successes uh, on your Devi show. So thanks so much for having me. Um, and I, I don't know if people follow you would, would remember that after spending 18 years at Camp Blanche, I decided that it was time to do my own show. It was as simple as that. And the, the difficulty is that when you're on television, it's not like you can send a CV or go to a recruitment company and say, this is who I am and I'm looking to do my own show. You almost need to hope that the universe is going to conspire on your behalf and, and send this to you. So um, a lot of people, when I say this to them, think I'm clearly crazy, but I believe in manifestation. So it, it goes back to the whole idea of having a vision board and every year, or every so often setting yourself up with a new task of what is it that you would like to do or where you see yourself. So um, I joined ETV and it was meant to have been a talk show. And they contacted me, which talk goes back to the whole universe conspiring, and said to me, look, would you like to join us? For me, it was a total no-brainer because of the numbers. ETV is a free-to-air uh, platform. And I always felt that more people needed to have access to the kind of investigative journalism that I've, I've loved for most of my life. But the difficult thing is that it was all very exciting and like seriously scary because when you leave a, a known brand like Carte Blanche, which is well over 30 years old, and, and now suddenly you, you're going to do this thing called the Davy Show, I mean, I knew I was well known and spent so many years building up my own brand, but in your head, it's not the same thing. It's totally untested and you need to prove yourself. I joined ETV and the idea was that I was going to do a talk show that was in February of 2020. And then the whole world changed in March of 2020. And I had been recruiting young creative people to join my team. And then we were doing Zoom meetings every single day and trying to figure out where it is that we were supposed to be going. And um, a lot of things happened. I think we were all shocked. I think we couldn't figure out what was the new next. And um, my mom passed away in May of 2020. She had been battling cancer for a very long time. And it was in that time, and we forget very quickly, you had to get a permit from the police station with a death certificate that would allow you to travel across provinces. We, we forget what COVID did. And it was on the way back that night at my mom's funeral back to Johannesburg that something just flashed in my head. I just thought, you know, when you lose somebody, I think it brings you close to reality and it makes you think about things a bit differently. And I asked myself, you're going to be launching some kind of show. What's the plan? And the plan has to mean that you're doing a show that speaks to people specifically in this environment and a talk show would never have cut it. First of all, who would, have, who would I have put on the couch with social distancing? This was going to be a talk show with one person at a time. There's not enough talking in that talk show. So just from a very practical point of view, it was never going to work. But now remember, you're now a cost center at a major South African television channel, what are you gonna do in the car that night? I thought, what do you do best? What do you love doing best? I love catching crooks. That's what I do best. So why don't I, in my half an hour segment, catch a crook, but get the balance by showcasing amazing people who live in South Africa who are doing out of the box thinking. So that for me was where I created the balance. 
And that's how the actual version of the Davy show that you're all watching now <laughs> um, was born. People thought I was crazy. I mean, even in my own team, I didn't have 100% buy-in because they saw it as too much of a dichotomy. It was way too opposing. Catching crooks, baddies, and then doing good guys. It didn't make sense. For me, in my head, perfect sense. That's what you call balance. Um, what, 20, 21 months in, uh, we speak to millions of South Africans every single week. It, I, I didn't expect the response. Um, I think people, when they go into new shows and have an idea, oh, we're going to reach this X amount, I always think it's, that's really fat headed thinking, especially in television. Because if you don't have, if you're not authentic about what you do, viewers are able to look through that very, very quickly. So grateful, absolutely. I mean, what would it have looked like? You leave Carp Blanche and then you go do this dad. Um, then the next hour I had to go into corporate. Nothing wrong with corporate, but you know, that, that's down the line. Um, I'm, I'm not ready for that right now. <laughs> That's amazing. So even within the show, you have pivoted. So just just talk to me about this, because I, I obviously don't know this industry that well. And a lot of our uh, listeners who are, in fact, in corporate, they are, you know, they, they, they don't know the media industry that well. So just tell us a little bit like, so you land the show and you can still pivot after. Like, how does that work? I work for a great channel. So let's just start there. I think um, if, if I worked at a channel where they were quite rigid in their thinking, then it could possibly have been a problem. But I think they also could see the practicality of what it was that I was saying. You couldn't rely on guests. You know, you look at, in any business, you analyze the risks. The risk was I book a guest, the guest test positive, no show. Now what? You can't line up standby guests in my industry because guy number two knows he's number two. You want to be number one. You don't want to be somebody standby. Um, and remember that there's, there's a whole load that happens behind the scenes. So, so that was the first thing. Or even worse, we have somebody that then comes on to the talk show and then test positive. In this model that I chose, everything was on me. I, I had to go out, get a story, research the story, obviously me and the team. And then we would go to people's houses and we would shoot outside or we would shoot in their garages or shoot in spaces that I knew would I'd be able to keep the team safe. Uh, keep whoever we were interviewing safe. And then, of course, catching crooks. You know, that happens in parking lots. There's nothing sexy about that. That is that is <laughs> what it is. So in, in a way, I, I chose a low-risk television model purely based on COVID, um, but I think high input value from our side because doing talk shows takes X amount of energy, which in my mind is a little bit less then doing investigative journalism uh, prepackaged the way we do it. Okay. And and you mentioned being, uh, you know, not wanting to create a dud after carte blanche, right? Now, just in terms of the numbers, you can show off a little bit. I think you've earned some bragging rights here. Um, <laughs> How, how, how much of the numbers, uh, in terms of the number of lives you're touching and, and influencing and reaching, how have those numbers changed along the way for you? Look, we, we rocketed very, very quickly. Um, we had to find our space in terms of the schedule. So obviously, the later you go, like on an ETV model, you have a bigger uh, viewership in the evening. Uh, so at 10 o'clock when we air, I mean, you, you, reach, you reach a couple million then. And then, and on the repeats. And then we were also now grabbing people on ENCA because we give the show to ENCA for free as our sister channel. Uh, we house in the same building. And then the online numbers are actually very difficult to count. But um, a fair amount of our audience actually comes from online, which has meant now also here I was. Also, so so you're, the, you're the face of the show. You're the executive producer of the show. You're now handling team members. HR is now part of what you do and you do the social media because you can't outsource social media. So we talk to millions. Wow. So I'm not going to put you in the difficult position of having to give uh, some kind of uh, ratio between the current viewership and what it might have been in the past. So I'm not going to do that, but I'm assuming that the numbers have grown exponentially and you just have to smile and not. <laughs> well, no, it, it has. Remember, pay, pay channel is a whole different kind of market, you know, premium content. Um, it, it, it's to totally different. And and here, that's what we, we, we but touch nice LSM though. I mean, we sit nicely between LSM five and eight, which is kind of where you want to be. 
Wow, that's amazing. So in this, um, in this, uh, you know, whole thing that happened on the show itself, there was there was some pivoting, right? And pivoting has been the hallmark of you and your career and how you continue to build yourself up and you continue to grow and you continue to be successful. Do you want to talk a little bit more? We'll get back to pivoting towards the end, but um, do you want to talk a little bit more about how you pivot? I didn't realize this about myself, but when you when you get into an industry like entertainment, radio, television, news in general, pivoting becomes a part of who you are from the very beginning. Uh, and, and, and I knew, okay, it was a dream of mine to work at Carte Blanche. I was 15 years old, growing up rural person in Natal. And you realize you can't just be a journalist on one platform. That's committing career suicide. You can't just write for um, a print publication, or you can't just work on television. So I set myself the task from very early on to take on every single opportunity that, that came my way. So while I started on radio, after I interviewed Nelson Mandela in 1998, don't do the math, long time ago. I then had oh. an invitation. From, yeah, long time ago. I, I, and then I had an invitation from the Sunday Times to then write a column. And I'm one of those chicks who will say yes, and I'll figure out how to do it later. So in my mind, you know the movies where there's snakes on the plane? In my yes. head, I'm, I'm the girl that lands the plane. Because, because you've got to pivot. You could go from passenger now to pilot because that's what you need to do. So it's a very scary space to be in. But I think it, it helped me grow a lot because I didn't just stay at, on radio. I, I was able to accumulate experience across print. Um, television came very early, car blanche. You know, so it, it made a massive difference because you cannot afford to be a one-trick pony. Not, not now, not ever. So I didn't realize I was, I, I've always been pivoting. Wow, that's, that's the, the, you know, and I, and I look forward to unpacking that a little bit more in a second. Um, now, we see a very brave face on TV. Like you always show up well. You always show up beautifully presented. You've got your game together. You know your stuff. You're confident. You're bold. You know, you call it catching crooks. Like you can't do that on the, on the defense. You have to do that on the offense. You know, you have to go in there and be sorted. Um, is there another side to, to, to Davy that we don't see? Yeah, people don't see that I'm a mom. That I raised children through most of it. Um, my, my daughter's 20, my son is 18 in the trick. And people don't see that I'm proudly South African, not necessarily all the time. I think when you're doing the negative stuff of catching the crooks, people may not see that. Um, I don't think people realize that I get irritated. No, they do realize that because you can see from my face. I think we realize so, that. <laughs> I, wanna, I cannot hide my emotions at all. I remember once a producer very early on in my television career said to me, because remember the way TV was done in the olden, olden days, it was very British, it was very, you know, you it's almost like you, 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 you were meant to be someone that didn't have a personality because the idea was that journalists and reporters did not have opinions and, and seemingly take sides. For me, that never worked because there has to be an authenticity with what you do. So pe people don't also see the fact that I'm a really practical person. Um, and, and people don't see that I, I'm, I'm a little bit of a crybaby. That you would never have guessed. Nope, not at all. <laughs> not at all. So, and I'm not sure I want to, I'm not sure we're ready to shatter the image yet of the bold, brave. Wait, wait, wait. Let me other movies are here. A cry baby. I cannot watch sad movies. That's what I mean. Okay. Okay. That that we can accept. That we can accept. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really keen to understand a little bit more about um, your childhood. What was your childhood like? Rural KwaZulu Natal, I grew up in Umzinto, which is on the south coast of KZN, near Park Lane and Scottborough, just to give it, people a little bit of um, a location there. And uh, I went to Catholic convent school. 
I grew up in a very primary school and I grew up in a very strict Hindu home, just my sister and I. And uh, the problem was that I had a really big mouth. Like it was a serious problem because I couldn't keep quiet. I was that girl when visitors came, my parents would pay me to keep quiet because I wouldn't be outside playing hopscotch or hide and seek or rounders with the other kids. I'd be sitting there in that formal lounge. You know, the only lounge we ever had, that formal lounge with the three, two, one sofa set up with the doilies down the back. And I would be having very adult conversations with the men because all the women would be in the kitchen. And um, so I threw myself into public speaking competitions from the time I was little. And the best part about a competition for me was writing a speech. And in 1988, um, a few big things happened to me. I won a ma major speech contest in KZN. And they presented KZN at UNISA. It was called the Natal Best Speaker Competition. And it was a big moment for me because I, in the finals, I was with these kids from very well healed schools, Michael House and St. Anne's and all the schools that you dreamt that you could attend. And I knew I, knew I was good enough. Uh, as I, I, I stood there as an equal, but I could look at these names, you know, on that brochure that they print and... Um, and I thought, this is what I needed. The, the second big thing that happened to me was that I watched the first episode of Count Blanche as a 15-year-old. And um, I thought to myself, this, this is what I want to do. And, and journalism clearly wasn't an obvious choice at the time. This is the 1980s. South Africa was burning. And my parents were really supportive. So I didn't go off like most Indian well-behaved Indian girls, and I didn't go to do medicine or anything in the medical field. Um, I think my parents were a little bit disappointed because I was smart at school, I always worked hard. I went up and did a BA degree at the University of Natal. So in terms of my setup, close, small, but very supportive community. Wow, very interesting that. And now I know that there's a particular story to do with um, touch typing that uh, you haven't really revealed yet. So do you want to just quickly touch on that? <laughs> I went to school at a time where typing was part of the school syllabus. So in standard six, you had to choose whether you wanted to do typing and there were a few other subjects that existed. And I chose typing. And the perception was that if you did typing, then you were one of the stupid girls because all you were preparing for was to be somebody's secretary, not PA. There was no such thing as a PA then was a PA system, like a mic with large crowds were being addressed by that. And I did typing. And, and people couldn't understand, why are you doing this thing? You could do so much better. I could see that in the future, I would need to know how to touch type because I wrote very well and I realized that typing would be the next, the next best thing. So what I did with the typing, so I've always been somebody that needed to have um, extra skills, you know, oh, I don't want to be a one-trick pony. So when I went up to university to earn some extra pocket money, I would, uh, I would touch type assignments for university students and I didn't realize it, but I later did that I've got this ability to autocorrect grammar as I type. So I think I was busy. I had to turn down work because all these students who didn't really write very well, suddenly I was writing assignments for all kinds of subjects. But again, it allowed me an opportunity to learn more about other subjects and I made, made good money at the time. Wow, so you're even making money out of it, huh? Yeah, I've always been somebody. I, for me, money is oxygen. You, if you're financially stable and if, if you've got that, that line, and you can breathe. And when you can breathe, you can be creative and, and then you can do amazing and wonderful things. So, so what I've always said to people, if you get your financial affairs and uh, sorted and out completely, it actually frees everything. So you live in a different world. Awesome. All right. So um, now you mentioned uh, rural KZN growing up. And, um, you know, I myself uh, grew up in a, um, you know, I would, I would imagine a similar situation. I mean, I just want to also point out that uh, the, the same last name doesn't imply that we are related. They are well, quite... Please, a, that here. please, because some people still think they don't, they don't realize, you know, we came here, 
But the British couldn't spell. We all ended up with the same surname. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 you know, you, you, you talk about growing up in a rural KZN. And um, obviously, you, you mentioned the three to one, and I'm not sure many people will get that. But hey, I get it. So I think that's awesome. Um, so, the, you know, there was a, a degree of overcoming some odds, overcoming some adversity to be who you are today. Um, this is a tough question. How does someone, um, you know, from, from, from who's sitting in that situation today or a similar situation today, how do they, uh, like, you know, using your lessons and what you've learned, how does a person overcome these uh, obstacles to still pursue what it is that they want? Sheer determination and hard work. There's no shortcut to this. you got to show up. And, and you've, you've, you've got to get that knowledge behind you. I was never, ever shy to go up to people and say, teach me how to do this. Show me. And not everyone is willing to teach. So I, I was also, I learned rejection. People are not going to teach you. They don't want to share skills all the time. But that never, ever stopped me from, from asking. But if you're not determined and you're not prepared to put in the hard work, it's not going to happen. That's it. Even, even now, every single episode of The Davy Show or everything that I do is intense research. People don't see all of that. They see me on television looking glamorous. That's makeup, by the way. And hey, and the people who do that, special people who do that on, on a channel, they don't see the hard work that goes behind it because I can't afford to look stupid. Before I walk in and do a confrontation with somebody, I need to know everything about that business um, I, because I'll be questioning the CEO who's been doing it for 30 years. And I'll never be able to get 30 years worth of knowledge in my head, but I can certainly try. Right, right, right. And, you know, is there, you mentioned determination. Is there a secret or is there a, a, some knack that you employed? I mean, to go from a 15-year-old who watches carte blanche in a very different South Africa, in a, in a system that did not make it easy for, um, you know, a woman and certainly not a woman of color to easily go in and win favor because ultimately media is about winning that approval and that favor, right? Um, yeah. What, what, like beyond the determination, was there any tricks or anything that you can like divulge and say that these are the one or two things you've done? I was very single-minded about it. So I had the dream, but I knew that you can't just finish the trick and then go and apply to carte blanche uh, and say you want to work for them because I had no experience. So I knew that I was very strategic about going and accumulating a range of experience, the whole thing about working in different media platforms, so that finally, when, when, I, when I got there, I would be able to show them a CV and a showreel. So a showreel is a television version of a, of a CV. Show them a showreel that would, would get me in the door. That's what I needed, first of all. And um, because it's television, you, you can't get away with not being good enough. Because people can see it. You cannot get away with, with the inexperience. But you have to start somewhere, so you're going to be inexperienced anyway. But it's almost a sense of, of, of watching yourself exceptionally critically. So if I had to think, how does somebody like me make, make it from Amazonto to carte blanche and then now to doing my own show? It's the determination. It's the hard work. It's the research. And it's, it's the, the ability to, to do the menial jobs. So I, I would make coffee for people initially when I was at like the SABC. I would, I would do whatever it took because I just wanted a front row seat. And I knew I'd sit there and, and I would absorb it all. Um, and, and I think the one thing I, I get a lot of now, especially from young people who meet me in shopping malls or wherever, keep saying to me, oh, they want to be on television. And I keep saying, what do you want to do on television? They don't know what they want to do on television. They just want to be on television. But it's that whole, you know, the Kardashian culture of, of, of me being famous is a way to earn a living. But it, it, I mean, it's not a sustainable way to earn a living. We all know that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> now, um, you mentioned, um, there's, there's so many questions here that I've got that I want to make sure that we power through. Um, you mentioned your kids earlier. Um, and, and I really want to know, and I'm, and I'm sure a lot of people do as well. What are you like as a parent? I'm a fair parent, but I'm very no nonsense. So I'm not that kind of parent where remember now when you grow up, 
and your mom's on carte blanche, you may think that your mother is going to come and solve all your problems at school. Uh -uh, I never did that. No chance am I ever going to do that. You're going, you're going to have to solve your problems by yourself. But I think what I always did with my kids is when they're in a difficult situation, they always feel free to come and they always chat to me. So we have a great relationship. But I always not tell them what to do, but get them to make the decision of what they should be doing and why. Because you know, it's really easy to molly coddle our kids and they're not necessarily as street smart as, as I was growing up. I grew up in a totally different environment. I mean, I walked to school and back. Um, so I think that's been good training for them is to, to have a mind that, that works through it and figures it out as opposed to going off to university, being far away from home on your own and then now trying to have to, to work it out. Um, so I don't know. You should actually ask them that question. I wonder what they would say. <laughs> I think I, I think what I might do is I might take a, take a leaf from your book. I might start my own investigative uh, journalism um, kind of vibe, and but I'll do it with families, and I'll just come in and I'll check. <laughs> that could work. Yeah, um, and then and then I know that there was a, a story um, that you shared with me that I know. Uh, you know, it, it really it really. Um, shared a lot with, even though it wasn't uh, a high, like a, it's, there's not a ton to the story, but to me, it really revealed a lot about where the world was at at the time. Tell me a little bit about this, this hairstyle thing that happened uh, with carte blanche and, you know, uh, like what happened there? It was one of the biggest turning points to me. So remember now, I grew up watching carte blanche. So Ruda Lankman and Derek Watts were the two people who were the, the main anchors at carte blanche. And when I, I was always somebody that kept sharing this dream with everybody. I told everybody that I wanted to be on carte blanche and that I was going to do it. But I quickly realized as I got older that sometimes there's some dreams you mustn't share because people can start saying things to you that could very easily put you off. So the one thing I kept hearing from people was, oh, that's never going to happen. You will never work for carte blanche because you look too Indian and you sound too Indian. In my head, I thought, well, I can't change that. So, you know, it is what it is. But it affected me in a very subvertive way that I, I didn't even realize. When I joined carte blanche, they, they said, well, join and let's see what happens. Remember, you joined freelance on television. There's no such thing as full time. Full time really doesn't exist. And um, in that first year at Carte Blanche, it was an absolute disaster, like big D, big disaster. And I mean, to the point where I was in Durban and everyone was saying to me, you work on Carte Blanche, you say that, we, work, we watch Carte Blanche every Sunday, we don't see you on the show. Of course, they never saw me because I only did the three stories in the entire first year. And I went back and I watched those stories at the end of, it was uh, 2002, to figure out what had I done that was wrong? What is not working? And when I watched myself with that very kind of independent eye, it hit me. I didn't look like me and I didn't really sound like me. So because, and I worked it out, I didn't see anybody that looked like me doing that job. So I cut my hair to look like Ruda Lantman and I copied her dress style thinking that is what I needed to look like uh, on carte blanche. So no wonder it wasn't working because it was totally inauthentic and viewers would have been able to see it. I'm sure the producers were able to see it. So when I went into my second year at carte blanche, it was do or die for me. And I said, the only thing I can, I know I can rely on is myself. So I wore my hair the way my hair was and I, I dressed in a Devi style and I presented in a way that I, I presented on radio, which was quite real and quite in your face. And that made all the difference. But I'm grateful that I learned the lesson. Imagine if I carried on thinking that I was doing the right thing. I, I'm not sure where I would have been now. Wow, that's quite a story. I mean, I really love that, uh, that story. I think, again, it says so much without saying it all, you know? in terms of yeah. where the world was at and what you went through. And, and perhaps one of, you know, we can extract one of your pearls of wisdom right there from that story in terms of how to create success. Be yourself because it'll work. It won't work if you're going to be somebody else because you're going to forget the lines. Because when yeah. you're yourself, you don't have lines. You know, you, you, just, you just speak because you are. 
Yeah, that's beautiful. That is awesome. So on that note, I'm going to touch very quickly on the fact that you are, in fact, also a business leader. You also lead a team. You have principles that you um, imbue into your team so that you bring out the best in them. Do you want to share like maybe um, some of your primary business philosophies with us? So when I started running my own show, it was a little bit of a shock for me because at Carte Blanche, the different people, they did different things. I had my role and I didn't have to manage or lead or, or anything. And I just was responsible for myself. And then suddenly now you're the executive producer of a group of young creators. And it can get extremely complicated. And I also figured out that best I get my game plan on because nobody wants an indecisive leader. So I kept thinking, well, how am I going to do this? I've got no experience. I, I, I didn't really lead. And then it hit me the one day that I was talking absolute nonsense. We all lead in our lives in different ways. And you don't need a title, executive producer or whatever, to make you suddenly a leader. And when I, when I thought back about the skills, what skills do I have to lead? And I remember I, I was lucky and I was raised by a group of very strong women um, and, and I, who were not CEOs of companies, who didn't even run companies, by the way. They were ordinary housewives, but they, it was my gran, my mom, and my aunts. And I realized I learned financial management through my mom. I learned how to manage a, a group of difficult people from my grandmother. And when I looked, I thought, well, I actually had a golden circle ticket to leading for my entire life. And, and when I looked at all the different work that I'd done, I may not have had a title, but I led. And in the end, the product was, I was always proud of it. That switched things in my head. And that's when I realized, when it comes to my team, we, we have a saying on, on the Davy show, we're a very small group of people. It's quite surprising how many people actually put that show together. My, my rule is you all get a seat at the table. I don't care where you are in the picking order and what you do here. You, whatever you do is making a valuable contribution to, to making our listeners and our viewers smarter. So the only rule is if you get to sit at the table, you don't eat for free. You have to contribute. You have to land something on the table so that we all we, we all eat together. And that's it. And the viewers and are, of course, at the center of everything that we do. That is awesome. That is beautiful. Love that. Um, so you mentioned uh, getting uh, you know some degree of financial guidance and help. Um, do you have any um, thoughts on this concept that I know you mentioned, uh, um, this concept of financial intelligence? Yeah. Why would a show like mine be successful when the majority of the time we talk about people getting scammed? So it talks about financial literacy. I interviewed somebody and they were saying to me, yeah, South Africans be so greedy and always want to make a, a, a quick buck. And then I thought, everybody wants to improve their lives financially. But what, we, what happens in our country is that we, we don't have any level of financial literacy. We don't, and we're very trusting people. So we would go to church and, and we would give that oak a thousand rand because he promised that he was going to give you 1,500 rand at the end of the week. And you believed him because you met him in church. And if you look at the story of most of these pyramid schemes and Ponzi scams and all of that, they all start like that. And it's because even at school, we never learned financial literacy. We never really learned that this is your salary. It comes in. This is how you budget. This is how you invest. We have no idea of how that even works, which is why we are so easily scammed. So, so the, the, the takeaway there is the takeaway, um, something along the lines that we need to like take some time out to learn the, the tools, the techniques, the methods of being smarter with our finances. Yeah, and you know what you'll also find? you find somebody will get a payout. They'll retire after 35, 40 years, of, and they'll have this lump sum. It won't be a hell of a lot of money, but it will be there. The first person that comes along, they invest it with them. They don't know, you know, your financial advisor needs to have written exams, needs to be registered somewhere. She needs to be you know, someone who's recognized, you know, within that organization. It's all those little, little tiny little things that, that we simply just don't know. We don't know enough because the majority of South Africans 
since, you know, we started to use money as a commodity in this country, I mean, black people didn't even have bank accounts for such a long time. People of color, you and what would you need a bank account for? You were earning so little, it was all gone. So it, it stems back to that. But we need we need to now start including more in, in the school syllabus. And more importantly, speaking to people and, and raising awareness, which was a big part of what we do on the show, is doing exactly that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's so important. I agree. And on that note, you know, it's about in order for all of these things to work and make sense, it is about building a more of a learning culture, a culture where people are willing to learn new tricks and not just cling to, you know, the methods of the past. So what are your thoughts on this concept of a learning culture? We must stop being lazy. Because a learning culture is a culture that decides to learn. That's how it becomes a culture of learning. A learning culture is, is, is a group of people that we, we, we're constantly going to be learning, but we must accept the fact that that's what needs to happen, right? Unless there's another definition of learning culture that I don't know. That is what you're talking about, right? Yes, 100%. Yeah. But that woke culture, there's another definition of woke culture the other day, and I was shocked. I didn't even know it. So it should, should be on the same page. So I think so many of us are happy to skate. You know, skate, got the job now. And, and, and you can't think like that. You've got to be able to diversify because I, I made sure. So like a good example, and oh, no, that's an old joke now, right? This is embarrassing, but it's part of what we're talking about. So I have to say, it. how do you know if someone has an MBA? Because they, they tell, tell you. They've got yeah, I'm doing the same thing now. So as a journalist, I always want to do an MBA. Why? I pictured myself working at Carte Blanche and confronting the CEO of that company, but being able to do the financial statements on my own. How are you going to do that? Well, let's do an MBA. Let me learn about business because I don't know enough anyway. Hardest thing I ever did. People said the stupidest thing I ever did and kept saying, well, you, you won't be able to use it. But I did use it. I more than used it. But if I was lazy and I didn't want to do it because it would be easier not to do it. I and I wasn't subsidized to do an MBA. Most people work for companies and the companies paid. I paid for it because I saw it as that MBA making me smarter. I never did anything for a certificate to hang on the wall. If you come to my house, you'll never find a single degree or anything hanging on the wall as far as a, a qualification is, is concerned. The other thing, I mean, I'm a qualified high school teacher. So people, are, why would you do that? Well, because I finished an honest degree in drama and performance studies and I needed to learn, have, a, have some kind of qualification. So I had the time and so I did it to UNISA part-time, needed to do it. It taught me how to teach. And you think about working on television. What are you doing? You're imparting knowledge in a simple way for people to understand, right? That's a teaching skill. That, that came mm -hmm. from some way. I went and learned how to do that. Um, I, and, and then I realized uh, a couple of years ago, well, I have all this knowledge. I think I'd be able to contribute if I sit on boards. Because the one thing I can do is like on paper, see the drama coming very easily because that's my job on television is to look on paper and see and speak to people and then realize oh this is how it's going to all end up so you, you become almost like um you, you end up with sites future sites so so that the sitting on the board well let's go learn how to do that i don't know how to do that no one's invited me onto a board so i can sit and learn via example so until that happens let me let me be ready when the opportunity presents itself and it did you know, we keep saying doors must open for us. Go open the door yourself. Then see what, what's in the room. Absolutely. Very well said. This is awesome. This is really on point. Um, so obviously, your, op your, optimis your optimism is not a blind optimism. It is backed by very, um, you know, by very valuable lessons. You are clearly very wise. You have uh, profound wisdom that you share in a very lighthearted way. So just tell me a little bit more about your opti optimism. Where does it come from? I've just always been an optimistic person. Um, I haven't had an easy life, you know, there were, there were always all these things that always were chucked at me and I had to learn to grow up very quickly and I, I had to learn to not just survive but thrive. Survive always makes me feel like, like I get this picture of someone just hanging on, you know, to, no, no, I, I, I thrived and it was those situations that I, that I learned from. But I always realized that if I wasn't my own champion and if I didn't 
stand up for myself, then then it would be easy to find myself in a hole and get scared and not move forward. These things all do make us stronger in the end. But I'll tell you why I'm, I'm really optimistic. Um, and most people will put it in the context of South Africa. I don't think we actually realize the value in our diversity. Do you know in many countries, they go out of their way to look for people from diverse countries, often from outside their own country, because when you bring that into a workspace, you get different ways of thinking. If we were all the same, we all think the same, companies will never, ever grow. And, and I always think to myself, why is it in our country after fighting so hard for democracy, we look at our government, look, our government needs to wake up, we all know that. Really, you know, you, you can't, you, you can't be in government for this long and then come tell me that things haven't changed because of apartheid. Like that, that's, not, that's not an argument anymore. And levels of corruption, et cetera. But what I'm saying is, in the end, the optimism in my mind comes from the fact that truth and justice will always prevail. I don't have any doubt about that. I've seen it. The truth always comes out. And the right thing always happens. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, okay, good. So you know this. The, the big, big, you know the show is a little bit about the tech side of life, right? But but like I said, um, you know this is not really a tech point. You know, tech means very little if people don't have the drive to actually make things happen. That's that's step one. And then and then the tech just becomes an, an an enabler. Whether you're using your cell phone to create your CV, or whether you're using a more sophisticated application or piece of software or whatever. Um, what for you is your quick um, advice or some of the quick ways of you doing things where you where you are making things possible because of some kind of technology. Right, that's an interesting one because I always thought I wasn't a tech person in the olden days. So I remember when I was having a, I was trying to do something at work when I was at the SABC and I had to phone a friend to help me sort it out. And while they were explaining, I was like, okay, which part are you talking about? The box part of the computer or the screen part of the computer or the keyboard part of the computer? That's where I came from. And remember, I had to grow very quickly because social media happened. I was always running my own business. I was always freelance. I didn't have an IT person I could call in the building to come and fix things or reload software. I had to learn and I had to learn very, very fast. The quick thing for me, if, if I were to think and, and, and to offer advice to people is make social media your friends. I had to learn to do my own social media. I had to learn to fix all my IT problems and need to figure it out myself. But if I had to think about quick ways in which you can use technology. And for me, social media is total technology. A lot of people don't realize that you are running an updated CV every single time you post on social media. So you got to sit and ask yourself tough questions around branding and brand. Who are you? Because we seem to make a mistake and think social media is all about, you know, I can post pictures of myself in a bikini while I'm on holiday and then I can go and uh, apply to a blue chip company for a job and they're not going to look at my social media or I can have a rant that and say really inappropriate things because maybe I drank too much or whatever it is. Use social media to your advantage. Um, I basically launched an entire show uh, yes, on a, on a broadcaster, but using social media as a massive, massive backup because I understood that normal television wasn't just going to be the only space in which the show was going to air, that I had an entire online audience too who had to buy into my brand. But I couldn't just do it now when I launched the Devi show. It was a decided thing. People don't see social media as broadcasting. That's the mistake that they make. I mean, young, I meet so many young people who say, oh, we want, we want to broadcast. I've got, I want to make this movie, but I don't have funds. Go make the movie. Use your phone. And then put it up on YouTube and then get to see what people actually have to say. Compared to 30 years ago, somebody like me had to get a job at the end of the day, get a job to work on a platform. You don't have to get a job at a radio station. Now you can do a podcast. You can. 
You can do all these things because the technology is there, but don't ever use the technology now as the, as the stumbling block. I can't. Well, you can't because you don't know how, and you don't know how because you didn't bother to ask. So you're still standing on the same spot now. If you want to move forward, go learn how to do it because that's how people are doing it now on their own. That's awesome. That is incredible. And that's on point. That is so in line with the message here. There's no excuses. Tech really does make it possible. No matter the industry, no matter what you're trying to break into, you can use some form of technology right now to blow the excuses to dust. That, that is just make, fantastic. Make your voice heard. Your yeah. voice can be heard now. I had to yeah. wait for someone to give me permission so that I can be somewhere to make my voice heard. You just have to press the button and it's done. Just yeah. talk sense and plan what you're going to say. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. I think this is phenomenal. I have learned so much from you today. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure getting to know you. Um, just before we wrap, I just want to ask you, is there any last thing that you want to say to us? Um, the, the, you know, the kind of people watching and listening right now are going to be, you know, your typical workers, people who are wanting to start businesses, people who are really trying to break out of whatever situation they're in to make it even bigger and better and more successful. Any last words of advice for us? Have a plan. Show up. Be nice. Be nice and, and, and people help. But with no plan, if you don't write it down and plan the steps, it's like driving from here to Durban without GPS. It can't, you can't just see the sea in your head and think you're going to be there. You need to know you're going to leave Joburg and what's the, where do you go from there? It's, it's a simple, simple, simple thing, but it's like whether you're mind mapping it for yourself, have a plan. I mean, I always have a, um, an open folder and I, and I call the folder Operation Vula. Vula in Isizulu means to open. Yeah. And, and every time I have an idea, whether it was Carp Blanche, it went into Operation Vula. Whether it was having my own show, the idea went into Operation Vula. Write it and then you can see it. Wow. Incredible, incredible advice. Thank you so much. You're an absolute star. What a pleasure Thank getting you. to know you. And I really, uh, you know, wish you continued success. I have no doubt that you're going to continue blazing the trail as you have, really setting an, ex an example for the rest of us and just keep going on your winning streak. I've got one more thing to say. I must always have the last one. You mind? <laughs> go for it, go for it, go for it. So, so people look at me and they think, what a successful life. She's so lucky. Uh, she, I mean, that's amazing. You know, she probably doesn't have bad things happen to her or well, you know, along those lines. Because when you watch people on TV, you think they live in this bubble and it's a perfect life, right? It's not, it's far from that, far, far from that. Um, don't be afraid to fail. I'm sitting here as somebody who has failed at so many things. But for me, I've never ever seen it as failure. People package it as failure. It was, an, it was a free MBA. It was an opportunity for me to learn because the only way you can be successful is if you fail a whole bunch of times. Make it your friend and learn from it. Wow, that's awesome. And that really does take so much of the pressure away because I think the pressure that comes with the fear of failure keeps people from doing so many things that they otherwise would do. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Devi. Really, 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 such a pleasure getting to know you, and I, and I, and I really hope we can stay in touch. I had a great time. Thank you. <laughs>